All right, good afternoon or good morning, whatever it is for you. We are gonna talk about hypothesis testing today. So, um, I'm not big on slides, but that's just kind of how it goes for the first part of this lecture, and then we'll do some examples in the second video. So please complete this lecture check before Wednesday, April 1st at 11.59 p.m. And so to motivate the idea, window here to motivate the idea of what we're going to talk about today. Um, let's start by talking about courtrooms. So what's the assumption that you have when somebody's on trial or something? You begin with an assumption that a person is innocent. And then with based on that assumption, you provide evidence and you weigh the evidence to sort of determine whether that assumption is realistic or not. And then when you get to the end of the trial, you either reject that assumption, you find them guilty, or you maintain the assumption of innocence. You fail to reject the assumption that the person is innocent in the first place. So in the context of hypothesis testing, statistical hypothesis testing, what that means is we begin with an assumption, but our assumption about is a parameter now. Remember the parameter is unknown, so we just have to make assumptions about it and we weigh evidence that tells us whether that assumption is realistic or reasonable or not. And in this case, the evidence that we have is the data that we've collected. So the data that we have either is compatible with our assumption about the parameter or not. Um, and then we either reject or we maintain the assumption about the parameter itself. So hopefully you can see kind of the parallel with how this is done in the courtroom and then how we're gonna do it in terms of statistical hypothesis testing. So that assumption about the parameter we begin with is called the null hypothesis. So as an example, let's, uh, I, there's a link here that you can click on and go to this article about the Cleveland Browns. And so, so this article um, details a scenario in which the Browns lost 11 coin tosses in a row. So this, I think this article, yeah, this is back from 2011. So that's been a long time. I think that's actually way back when the Browns sucked. So try to, you know, try to use your imagination and remember what the world was like then. But we, um, winning and losing the games is not what we're interested in. It's the fact that they lost 11 coin tosses in a row. So that might have raised some red flags to some fans. I think there were some Browns fans and, and you know what it takes to, you know, Browns fans are generally pretty realistic and reasonable people. So, um, but even after they lost 11 coin tosses, some Browns fans were kind of saying, hey, wait a minute, I think maybe the NFL has a conspiracy against us if we're losing all these coin tosses. So the question is, is it really that crazy to lose 11 coin tosses in a row? You assume there's a 50% chance you win or lose the coin toss. Um, does losing 11 in a row mean that something fishy is going on? Does it potentially mean like that the NFL has some, has some vendetta against the Browns or something and they have fixed the coin toss proportion or something? So in this context, the way the problem would begin is we would begin with an assumption about the parameter, our null hypothesis here. So in this context, the parameter we're interested in is P, that's the proportion or the probability that you win a coin toss. So let's assume then that a coin toss, you've got two outcomes, right? You can win it or lose it. We're gonna assume it follows a Bernoulli distribution with the proportion P. I don't know what P is. We're gonna make a hypothesis about it. And we're gonna weigh the evidence that we have and see if the evidence that we have is compatible or incompatible with our null hypothesis. So the data that we have is that out of 11 coin tosses, we lost all 11 of them. And so just like we were gonna do with the courtroom, we're either gonna reject our assumption about the proportion or maintain it based on the data that we have, the evidence that we have. So in this case, the hypothesis be we begin with, and this is gonna be the same thing that we do when we, you know, in the courtroom, you assume somebody's innocent until proven guilty in statistics. We're assuming that it's kind of the status quo or something, or we're assuming that there's no unusual relationship or something like that. So in this case, our null hypothesis would just be that the proportion or the probability that you win the coin toss is 50%. So if we suspect that the NFL has this conspiracy against the Browns or something, the burden of proof is on us to prove that. So we need to start with the assumption that there's nothing wrong, that there's no unusual circumstances going on. And in this case, that means the assumption that P is equal to 50%. So we can write it like this. 
as I have in this line here, my null hypothesis H subscript zero, H naught, is that P is equal to 50%. Keep in mind, we make hypotheses about parameters, not statistics, because we don't know what the parameters are, so we have to hypothesize about their values. So we've formed our hypothesis now. We need to weigh the evidence. Is losing 11 coin tosses strong enough evidence? Because keep in mind, we can't just have a little bit of evidence. If somebody's on trial for robbing a bank or something, you might have one piece of evidence is the fact that they were at the bank that day. But you can't convict somebody on that. So, you know, out of 11 coin tosses, maybe we lost seven of them. Is seven coin tosses lost out of 11 strong enough evidence for you to think that there's some deep conspiracy going on or something? Um, but the point I'm trying to make here is that the amount of evidence we have is kind of a scale. At some point, if you win five and lose six of your coin tosses, I don't really think anything fishy is going on. If we win four or lose seven, I still don't think anything's up. What if we get to the point where we win one and we lose 10 coin tosses? What if we win zero and lose 11 of them? At some point there, you have crossed over between thinking is reasonable and totally realistic and thinking something is not reasonable and maybe conflicts with my assumption that the probability is really 50%. At what point did you change your mind about what was realistic? At what point was the evidence strong enough for us to claim that, well, maybe our hypothesis that it's 50% really isn't a realistic thing? So, in order to do that, in order to decide what is strong enough or what's unusual enough, we have to choose a rule about what constitutes strong enough evidence. So, you know, back to our bank example, it might be that strong enough evidence means you were at the bank that day and you, we found money with serial numbers associated with the bank in your car or something like that. We need lots of evidence and it has to be beyond a certain threshold for us to reject our assumption that you're innocent and conclude that you are not. So it's the same thing with statistics. We need to kind of decide beforehand, well, what's gonna be strong enough evidence? And you have to decide it beforehand, otherwise your opinions might kind of bias the decision that you make. So let's choose a rule then. If our evidence is extremely unusual or incompatible with my assumption that P is 50%, we'll reject our null hypothesis and conclude that the probability that the Browns are winning coin tosses is actually less than 50%. The way I've phrased it here, uh, it's still kind of subjective. What makes the evidence extremely unusual or not? So one way that we do this a lot, and there will be much more on this in a couple more slides, but let's suppose that an extremely unusual amount of evidence means that there's a 5% chance of occurring or lower. And we're going to keep our assumption that P is 50% until we've proven or until we've suggested otherwise. So if this is my rule for being extremely unusual, meaning there's only a 5% or less chance of happening, is winning three or fewer coin tosses, would that be extremely unusual under this, under this criterion that I've set? So if we have T, the coin tosses you win, follows a Bernoulli with 50%, the probability that you win three or fewer coin tosses, and you can see the math I've done here. You know, you can think back to a previous stat course when you did the binomial distribution, I'm not gonna to be too worried about the calculations we've made here, but this is how you would calculate whether um, T is less than or equal to three from a binomial distribution. So remember this notation, 11 choose three, that's the number of ways that you can win three of the 11 coin tosses. You could win the first and the third and the seventh. You could win the second and the eighth and the ninth. There's lots of different ways you can win three out of 11 and we have to account for those in this probability computation. So it turns out, if you do the math that I've, that I've written here, it turns out there's about an 11% chance of winning three or fewer coin tosses out of 11. And that doesn't sound very crazy or unusual to me. 11% is a little more than one out of 10. There's, what, 30 teams in the NFL, right? So 11% would be, you know, we would expect about three teams to win three or fewer coin tosses out of 11. But that's really not really that unusual. If you were in a courtroom, and they got to the point where they said there's like a one in 10 chance that you robbed the bank. Can you throw somebody in prison for that? Definitely not. So we cannot reject our assumption that P is 50%. The evidence isn't very strong here. But what about uh, if we lose, or I'm sorry, if we win two or fewer coin tosses, does that seem unusual enough? 
if you do the computation for winning two or fewer, it turns out there's a 3.3% chance that you win two or fewer coin tosses out of 11. And 3.3%, if you think about it, still is really not that unusual. Um, there's what, 150 people or so taking stat 3202 right now. So 3% of that, you know, that's what, four or five people or something like that. So, you know, 3.3% is not that unusual, I don't think. But according to the rule we made a couple of slides ago where I said it was gonna be a 5% chance as my threshold of being unusual enough, in this case, winning two or fewer would be evidence for us to reject our null hypothesis. So in this case, if we observe two or fewer coin tosses one, we would reject our null hypothesis. So um, in the context of the Browns example then that we're doing here, because winning zero out of 11 is gonna have less than a 5% chance of happening, we would reject our hypothesis. So the procedure for hypothesis testing follows these four steps. Start by writing your null and alternative hypotheses about your parameter theta. So we've talked about the null hypothesis, we'll write an alternative hypothesis here in a few minutes when we do some examples of this. So you create your hypotheses about a parameter. We'll start with parameter mu, and um, isn't for the first examples we look at, but we can hypothesis test about any parameter. We'll do hypothesis tests on the variance in a little bit, and we'll talk about the proportion p and the mu mean parameter in a distribution. Any parameter you want, you can conduct a hypothesis test. That's step one. Step two, you have to decide what's a rule for when you're gonna reject and when you're gonna fail to reject. You need to make the decision before you look at the evidence, before you look at the data, of what's gonna be convincing enough evidence for you to reject your null hypothesis. And we'll talk about much, much more in detail about that in a few minutes. Step three, you actually analyze the data and decide whether the data meet that criterion that you set in step two or not. Do the data actually meet the rule that you just decided in step two to reject or fail to reject the hypothesis? So basically we're looking to see then whether our data are compatible with the null hypothesis being true or do not seem to match the reality of the null hypothesis. And then step four, finally, you reject the null hypothesis or you fail to reject the null hypothesis. We either keep our assumption about the parameter we made in step one or we reject the assumption that we made about the parameter in step one. So in the Browns example, what we would do is we create a null hypothesis that P is equal to 50%. And then our alternative hypothesis, in this case, there's more than one way to write the alternative. But so you need to think about, you know, from sort of a scientific standpoint, what is it you're interested in in this particular problem? Well, here, you know, as us being Browns fans, we were worried that the NFL had rigged it so that there was a low probability of us actually winning the coin toss. So if you think about what you're trying to show, what you're trying to prove, you need to make that the alternative hypothesis. Just like the prosecutor, if they're trying to show somebody's guilty, you gotta start with the assumption that they're not. You have to start by assuming the opposite of what you wanna show, and then that puts the burden of proof on you to show it. So if I'm trying to convince people that the NFL has it out for the Browns, I need to make that my alternative hypothesis. So that's gonna start by P less than 50%, that somehow, some way, there's a lower than 50% chance that the Browns are actually gonna win their coin toss. And then the null hypothesis is sort of the, the status quo, or that everything is according to what we think it is by the null hypothesis. So that's step one. Step two is choose a rule. And before the way we did this, we chose the rule, let's reject their null hypothesis if two or fewer coin tosses are one. And the reason we picked that as our rule, remember, you need a lot of evidence to reject your null hypothesis. If I just said, well, maybe if I lose, or if I lose more than half of my coin tosses, that's going to be evidence that the coins are rigged against me. That's not a very good rule. Because like if we flip a coin 100 times and you lose 51 times, are you really convinced that the probability is less than 50%? That doesn't seem like very convincing evidence or not. So again, we'll have more about how we choose that rule in a couple of slides. Then step three, we observe our data. We looked at the 11 coin tosses and saw that they lost all 11 of them. And we check to see whether our data matches with the rejection rule or does not. And in that case, we either reject or fail to reject our null hypothesis, depending on whether our data matches with the rejection rule or not. 
So what I still need to talk about here then is how we choose that rejection rule. Because it's kind of arbitrary for me to just pick, okay, maybe losing two coin tosses or losing three or whatever is what we're gonna, what's gonna make us reject our null hypothesis. So we need a much more scientific way of choosing the rejection rule. And then another question that we haven't answered yet is are we right or wrong? Because ultimately we're gonna reject the null or fail to reject the null. Ultimately you're gonna convict somebody and send them to prison or not. The question is, were you right? And the thing about courtrooms, we've seen sometimes they weren't right when they made that, uh, they let somebody innocent go to jail or they let somebody guilty go free. It happens in reality. And it's gonna happen in statistics as well. The problem is we didn't even know at the end of the day whether we were right in statistics because the parameter is never going to be something that's known. So were we right or wrong in our decision? We'll never know the answer to that, but we need to think very carefully about the implications of that, of whether we were right or whether we were wrong. So we can be wrong in two ways. A type one error is when we reject our null hypothesis even though we shouldn't have. And so we shouldn't have means that the null hypothesis was actually true. So a type one error is when you reject a true null hypothesis. The type two error, we fail to reject even though we should have. Um, and that's so where we fail to reject our null hypothesis even though it's not correct. So a type one error would be like sending an innocent person to prison and a type two error would be like not convicting a guilty person. Which one's worse? That's a question without an answer. That's a really tough question and it's the same in statistics too. Which one's a worse one to make? Depends on what we're talking about. So to kind of summarize that information, there's four things that can happen when you conduct a hypothesis test. So in one case, either your null, your null hypothesis is true. If the null hypothesis is true, we can reject it, which would be wrong, right? Because we don't want to reject it if it's true. That's what's called a type one error. We use alpha to denote that. But if the null hypothesis is actually true and we fail to reject it, well, that was correct, wasn't it? That means we've made the right decision. On the other hand, your null hypothesis can be false. If we reject it, that's good. That's what we want. We want to reject the false hypothesis, so we were correct in that case. But we could also fail to reject it when it's false, and that would be what we just called a type 2 error that we denote beta. So um, this table, I think, summarizes it pretty well. This is make sure you know the difference between type 1 and type 2 errors. So now that we know what type one error is, this is what's gonna give us a scientific and defensible way to choose the rejection rule. And so what we're gonna to do to choose our rejection rule is we're gonna pre-specify a type one error rate. We're gonna predetermine the amount of time that we're gonna be willing to make a type one error. So you may be thinking, well, why don't we just, having a low error rate seems good, right? We don't wanna make mistakes. So why don't we just make the type one error rate 0%? And so the problem with that is that we would never reject our null hypothesis then. The only way that we can be completely sure that we never make a type one error, and remember that means we never reject the null hypothesis when it's actually true. The only way we can be sure that we've never made that mistake is we just never reject the null hypothesis. And that would mean in a courtroom that we never convict anybody. No amount of evidence is strong enough to shake our assumption of them being not guilty. And in statistics, this would mean that no amount of data, no amount of evidence, no matter how convincing, if we do a thousand coin tosses and lose all 1,000 of them, even that's not strong enough evidence for us to reject our assumption that P equals 50%. So a type one error rate of 0% might sound like a good thing, but we can't completely minimize the error rate. Otherwise, we're never gonna make any decisions. Otherwise, we're never gonna listen to the evidence or really actually consider the data that we've collected. So usually what we do is we specify an alpha level, our type one error rate, we choose 5%, 1%, or 0.005%. That's what I see most often. In some sciences, I've seen alpha chosen to be 10%, but I think that's way too high. A 10% type one, you know, 10% might seem kind of low, but that's one in 10, you know, that means for every 10 people who conduct an experiment, for every 10 people who conduct an experiment, one of them made a mistake that we didn't pick up on. And that's a lot if you think about science, you know, do you really think like a 10% error rate on these tests for whether you have a virus or not are gonna cut it? I don't think so. I think 10% would be way too high. Imagine telling 
a bunch of people who don't have a virus that they do or telling a bunch of people who don't have the virus that they or telling people who do have it that they don't making a mistake like that on 10 percent of people could be a disaster so um the reasoning behind choosing five or one or 0.005 percent is it says we need a lot of evidence to reject our hypothesis but we can't say we need too much to reject our hypothesis or else we'll never reject any hypothesis so we have to balance between sending innocent people to jail and never sending anybody to jail basically okay so i'm going to stop this video now this is about the theory so watch this video again if you have to to get all the terminology down and we'll actually put this into practice and if there's things you're confused about from the first video hopefully they'll make a little more sense when we actually crunch some numbers and do some data analysis here and look at this so i will um do a second video so we don't have to have this one be too long with where the examples are done i encourage you to look at the notes that are posted to carmen before you watch that video so you kind of know where we're going uh, with all of the content that's provided.